Sean Prober, and you're once again joining me to discuss all things American and how best to proceed. Today, we're up to Federalist Paper number four in our 85 part series about the Federalist Papers. Now, to me, I wanted to go through old documents. There are so many debates nowadays. Uh, between all political parties and all of our people about what was intended here, what was intended there. And I wanted to kind of look back with complete open arms to new ideas and a very unbiased approach and just kind of look at everything. I, I think I've said before that uh, I think I'm more libertarian leaning uh, historically, uh, le at least in my voting. and. I wanted to kind of challenge those ideas. I think it's always healthy to challenge the ideas that you hold uh, the most. And by doing so, I wanted to go through the old arguments for the union. Uh, see, see if there's something there, something, something that we could salvage. And, and also ask ourselves, what, what exactly happened from this point in history? Uh, from the time of the Federalist Papers to now. Have these arguments held up? Um, ha have they come true? Have, have the premises laid out here come true? And that's something that I think is very interesting to myself and hopefully interesting to other people. So John Jay, Federalist number four, he's been talking about foreign policy, he's been talking about military, and if you had to sum up the whole thing in, in one paragraph by him, I think it would be the following. It is too true, however disgraceful. It may be to human nature that nations in general will make war whenever they have a prospect of getting anything by it. Absolute monarchs will often make war when their nations are to get nothing by it, but for the purposes and objects merely personal, such as thirst for military glory, or revenge for personal affronts, ambition, or private compacts to aggrandize a support, the particular families or partisans. These and a variety of other motives, which affect only the mind of the sovereign, often lead him to engage in wars not sanctified by justice, or the voice and interests of the people, but independent of all these inducements to war, which are more prevalent in absolute monarchies, but which well deserve our attention. So if you're listening to that and you know that we've always been at war <laughs> since, since this, that there's always been some kind of just war in democracies and democracies have spread all over the world and monarchies have fallen, but we don't necessarily have fewer wars. Uh, maybe fewer skirmishes that, um, on, on different, on smaller scales, but, but at least in American tradition and with our, our, what our money goes to, there have been very few times that you could point to even two to three years in American history that didn't have some war. So, you kind of fall into two camps. Those were all justified, or some of them were justified, some of them weren't justified. But the idea that you wouldn't have any uh, any wars that are really of no benefit to the people and actually harm the people, if you got rid of monarchies or if you got a, a powerful democratic republic in this instance, doesn't doesn't seem to be so true. But to continue with France and with Britain, we are rivals in the fisheries and can only and can supply their markets cheaper than they themselves now withstanding any efforts to prevent it by bounties on their own duties on foreign fish. So this falls into a giant, giant topic. And that, that was fishing, uh, the, the fishing industry. Uh, it, it was maybe the most, maybe the, the single most important factor leading up to the Revolutionary War. And we don't really talk about it that much. Uh, so to jump into a little bit of a tangent, because to be completely honest, I find that the John Jay Federalist Papers have some redundancy. So, and trying to be a little bit different and kind of go through uh, these topics and bring more light to it and more life to it. 
I thought we'd jump into a little bit of a tangent real quick. The fishing was a huge, huge industry in the New World for well over a century before American independence. There's this um, area in Canada, modern day Canada, called Newfoundland. And uh, there's a fascinating history there involving France, uh, who, who initially founded uh, that area and started doing f uh, fishing industries in the 16th and 17th century. In the 17th century, with navies caught up in the wars of Spanish, uh, Spanish secession, uh, the market crumbled. By 1713, the Treaty of Artec, uh that brought the end of the war of Spanish secession to an end, recognized British sovereignty of the entire island. Um, although there were permittances of, of French people being allowed to use certain areas at certain times, but, but it was to be greatly controlled by England at this point. So as you can imagine, running this program all the way from the other side of the Atlantic um, wasn't always easy. Not, not the best job to go over uh, all the way to the other side of the world to fish and, and come back and do this. Um, in, in the 20s, Ireland was going through a bunch of famines and England was able to get a lot of cheap labor and, and often use these Irish people as their uh, as their go to eventually in the market um, as they were going through this, so in uh, 1670 even though we start to see something really really interesting, and that's American merchants begin sending their trading ships, and by the 18th century, you see a major strides in the market. A lot more of these American ships, a lot more of these American warehouses built. A lot more labor that, that's just living in America at this point. So these American merchants were able to operate year-round. Year-round. And they obviously led to, uh, you have England, you have England kind of controlling uh, th this American merchants, and you have these French contingents. Um, so you have pretty much English domination. Uh, over, over these years, and the 60s and 70s were literally the best years in British fishing history. Now, the problem here comes in that the American merchants, as we just said, they're able to do better. Um, and as Jay, Jay later writes, that they're able to outperform the English and the French and the Spanish and whoever. Um, with, with what we're doing over here and what kind of systems we've built. And England doesn't like this because they have a whole industry in England and a whole bunch of people that are, are making money uh, that are English. And they regulate the heck out of these Americans and New England uh, who, who have built up their own industry, especially on cod. And eventually, England says no, nobody, no American merchant can even sell cod uh, anymore. Uh, no more of the, this cod industry in 1775. For, for uh, just the background, like 35% of the economy of New England was through this fishery. And it makes sense that they would have a major issue with this. So merchants converted their ships into military ships. The old fishing lines became supply lines. Fishermen armed and manned the first American Navy, served in the first Coast Guard units, manned privateers, and they even fought on land. So this was a major issue. It's it's interesting that you don't hear so much about cod. You hear so much about tea, but uh, to a large degree, this uh, had as much to do with it. I was looking at my cup. I got this. I thought it was kind of a theme. So if you can see closely, that's Harry and Kate, uh, Will's wife. It's like a Chinese misprint that I saw in a store. 
there's a fictional a fictional world where those two ended up together and me the only person to know about it um so kind of coming back to now that just the cutthroat nature for hundreds of years is just fishing and this this is not the only topic and not not the only competition uh spain as jay put it spain uh thinks it can be convenient to shut down the Mississippi or to charge crazy amounts of money to use it. Uh, British has the same kind of thing with St. Lawrence and on the other side, all of these markets, even China ha has markets that now we're competing with. And how Jay put it, uh, we, we shall deceive ourselves if we suppose that any of them will rejoice to see it flourish. Makes sense in industry. Um, if they're, if it's true that we're taking part of this market, I think sometimes there's ample room, you know, in marketing, for instance, there are so many companies. So to be petty and kind of competitive in a cutthroat way, you, you could be a little bit nicer. I, I think when you're talking about trade at this point in history, it's a bit more more cutthroat, a little bit less plentiful uh, in the in these markets. And, and Jay would say it's uh, it is easy to see the jealous um, the jealousies and uneasiness may gradually slide into the minds and cabinets of other nations, and that we are not to expect that they should regard our advancement in union and power, and consequently by land and by sea with an eye of indifference and composure. In a way, I think that this is maybe the best argument against uh, the anarchism or uh, a really small state, a kind of min minarchist uh, view of a libertarian society. That, to me at least, uh, in, in our world's history, no land rich in resources exists because of the indifference and composure of the rest of the world. Their sovereignty comes from their ability to defend their sovereignty with violence, or at least the threat of violence in the areas incapable or dependent on powers that can, opening themselves to this kind of vassalhood and uh, not, not true autonomy uh, to, to be, for instance, protected by Spain. You can imagine that, that these deals you get a, a bit of a cut taken out of everything. So to play devil's advocate to that, um, and present what I hope is kind of the anarchist stance, that, not that I'm an anarchist, but I think they, the, the opposition of this, the more confederist um, state, so that the decentralized system is harder to overtake because there is no figurative head to chop off uh, of the system. To destroy this organism of a country. Jay would say that the aggressor would benefit from each of these decentralized systems selfishly maintaining their energies and resources to maintain their own region. So this idea that if this battle starts, it could have maybe been completely stopped and everybody protected, but you have nobody else helping except that one specific confederacy and they get through that one and I kind of think of it in terms of uh, like a John Claude Van Damme movie that he gets into a situation and there are 10 people that surround him and one of them comes at him and attacks at once and he's able to beat him but like if they all just jumped on him he probably would have been able to you know, just overwhelm him but, but they don't do that so uh, that, that's my, my theory on war, of, of togetherness on war. So one government can collect and avail itself of the talents and experience of the ablest men. We went over this one in the last one, but he, he kind of says it again. In whatever part of the union they might be found. Uh, it can move on uniform principles of policy. It could harmonize, assimilate, and 
protest, uh, protect the several parts and members and extend the benefits of its foreign and precautions to each. So, so that's that point, that you, you would have the top people in each and they would be protecting in, in the most efficient way. You wouldn't have the chaos of all these separate areas trying to, in a, in a pinch, figure out exactly what to do. There are some examples where he uses about the United Kingdom uh, is a good piece of argumentation of just bringing up another area that, that's had a similar kind of occurrence or, or similar kind of confederacy um, with Wales, with, with Scotland, with England, and how much more powerful they are when they're together than and if they're limited. And, and that, that seems to be uh, some truth. Um, this idea that there's always going to be a bad man on the other side of the hill. And there's always going to be somebody who wants what you have, you have a good thing. And it's often better to be prepared and better to be in larger numbers than smaller numbers. So there's definitely some truth there. And he goes on to say, but whatever may be your situation, whether firmly united under one national government or split into a number of confederacies, certain it is that foreign nations will know and view it exactly as it is. And they will act towards us accordingly. I like that, that the word is very, very fair. Uh, what a poor, pitiful figure will America make in their eyes. I guess that he restrained himself to, to get you with, with that one. And um, the, the part that resonates with me on this one, I, I think the most is about just the, the insulted king and his petty reasons for going to war. Um, when George W. Bush went to war with Iraq, people often said that he was doing it because Saddam had tried to kill his father. So, I think sometimes, and even in a democracy, you're able to get your interests across. And to be repetitive and, and to kind of go into what we were saying last time, I find that there's so much discussion in, in the Federalist Papers about one of the four confederacies. We always talk about it like that was the plan. It was, wasn't was exactly. But, you know, if you, if you think about America broken up into quarters, there's so much talk about one of those quarters forcing the hand of the other three and that, the prevention of that uh, being necessary. And I, I can't help but visualize our current system even if you want to look at it into confederacies, because there are certainly very different areas of our country. I live in the South. Um, I used to live in the North. I used to live in New York. I live in Florida now. There's a world of difference. Uh, you live in one place and there are signs all over the place in every subway of Manhattan. There are signs that say, you know, like 20 years a bullet or something. And then you come down to Florida and people have a gun on their hat. And it's, it, shocking uh, when, when you when you don't realize it and you don't get used to it and there are different mentalities on, on so many things but um, I think it's more fun down here there. but I, I digress that if, if we imagine our current situation um, being together there, there, it's not like New York and New England rallied us into the war on terror or wanted us to go into Syria um, and wanted to assist in destabilizing uh, Assad's regime and perpetuating um, and prolonging the, the civil war. But it was something other. So it doesn't seem like there's any consideration in, in this part about this other, this, this growth of this government uh, that that somehow removed from all the interests of all the different groups. We're not saying one specific group get their way and, and pull. It's rather there's this fifth, and to use our four uh, confederacy is kind of scope. There's this fifth model that we didn't realize expands in the way it does. Yeah, and that, that explains why some of these arguments might not have lived up to 
being true over the, the next hundred or so years. Something to think about. Um, very, I think the scariest topic, right? That, that there's some, that there's some element of government that has no interest in the public's desire. It has its own desires. Maybe, maybe desires that it thinks are, are best for people. Like that, that's a very possible scenario. Um, the best villains think that they're doing good, uh, and it's often very true with, with those kind of leaders. So. So, something to consider for sure. So that was uh, episode four. I hope you liked all the, the tangents and all the different things um, that, that we covered. I don't think any of uh, the other reviews on the Federalist Papers went into some of those topics as extensively. So I'm looking forward to finishing up J with five. I know I thought that this was the last J. There's one more, he gets sick. We don't see him again until like 60 something. And then we get into some Madison, we get into some Hamilton, just party, party away. So thank you for joining me. It's always a pleasure. I think next time we're gonna have um, maybe a musical number, something to look forward to. So take care everybody, last weekend.